Hello everyone, I'm Mary Kiriakidi, Global Thought Leader at Kantar, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by a man who needs no introduction, Mark Ritson. We've recently released a guide um, that is titled Modern Marketing Dilemmas. And my first question to you is, have you read it? Yeah, yeah, I read it, I read it straight away and um, enjoyed it. Yeah, very good. Oh, that's wonderful. And I'm, I'm feeling honoured. Uh, well, both about uh, the fact that you've read it and about your very kind comments. And for those who haven't read it, um, what we've done in this guide is that we've debated seven of the most persistent conundrums that marketers have been wrestling with for years. Now, it's a full on investigation, though. You know, we don't present the answer. We kind of let people decide for themselves. Uh, but we stress repeatedly that the answer lies in using a more balanced approach. Now tell me, Mark, um, when marketers come to your mini MBA, are they often perplexed about how to do their job? Yeah, they are. It's a, I mean, it's one of the reasons the mini MBA in marketing exists is we have a lot of marketers, I, I think very uh, high potential marketers who don't actually know in, enough about marketing um, yet. And it's not that hard to fix. So yeah, we get a lot who are, partially trained or have grown up in one corner of the discipline or another. And one of the lovely things about training them is it only takes 10 weeks, but they go, oh, I get it now. It all clicks together. You know, I see how it all works. I understand the bits I was missing and the bits I actually knew. And it's a very nice thing to see that happen because, of course, once you have that, you're much more confident and, and you're much better at your job. Mm hmm. And and throughout the course, uh, throughout the mini MBA, do you tell them what to do or do you ask them to form their own opinion? Oh, it's very much the latter. I mean, I mm -hmm. tell them very much like your report. I sort of tell them about the, the debates. Um, I show them case studies. But in most cases, as you know, I mean, with, with any brand or marketing challenge, there isn't a correct answer really mm -hmm. so it's more about giving them the tools for them to go and work out what they should do um and that's the thing we focus on is equipping them with tools so they can then attack the problems that they face not telling them that the answer is x y or z because i think that's that's naive and not helpful yeah. i mean i'll give you a good example i mean i guess your it's your final dilemma in your report mm -hmm. but i grow weary of this you know you can't you can't spend any money on loyalty or mm -hmm. on you know on loyal consumers you have to go for penetration you have to recruit new consumers well yes but but no um it, it, all things being equal it's true we need to focus on you know penetration and recruiting new customers light buyers yeah fine mm -hmm. but it depends on the situation you're in with respect to your customer base and to your point about dilemmas and, and, and making good choices, there are many, many, many brands that actually can and should do both. That should be recruiting new consumers, but also should be focused on existing customers, loyalty, increasing share of their business. I mean, I've worked for a lot of banks who do both very well, and there's no reason you can't do both. So mm -hmm. I don't think you can tell a marketer what to do. I think you can make them aware of all the options, tools, and thought processes and then then they they get to decide that's the point yes yes exactly that and i confirm i've been on both um, mini mbas and you do do that um yeah I, yes i don't um i think people who know me from my column i think expect it to be me shouting at people you know what <laughs> i mean for an hour every week and so on but being a columnist is very difficult different from being a professor you know, when you write a column, you have to people off and, you know, grab attention and so forth. But when you're teaching people, it's a very different, you know, it's a very different setup. Do you know what I mean? So I think, yeah, it's a surprise to people who haven't done the course that I'm not just shouting at them and telling them what to do. Correct, correct. And I've said it many times before, you're you're very nurturing as a teacher. Um, yes, thank you, Mary. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll take that. That's a good compliment. Now, last question, Mark. You've recently written an article about the seven steps to kicking one's price promotion addiction. And it got us really excited at Kantar because on your seventh step, you used our data, Kantar data, and mm. you linked brand differentiation with pricing power. 
Now, mm -hmm. I will play it naive here, okay, as if I've never seen this data before, and I will ask you to indulge me. How are the two linked? Please tell me. Well, to be fair to Kantar and to you, I mean, I think you've kind of kept the lights on on this particular point when all around us, everyone has forgotten it. We've been so obsessed with how brands grow revenue market share penetration. We've kind of ignored, are they making more or less money? Now, if you mm -hmm. want to drive penetration, if you want to increase number of customers and revenue and so forth, then it's certainly true that things like distinctiveness, salience are very, very important. And Kantar data supports that too. But when we turn our attention to profitability, price insensitivity, uh, making better margins, it m becomes much more about differentiation. And differentiation does a lot of things, but one of the most important things it does if you truly achieve it in the mind of the consumer is it reduces the perception of you as a commodity. You know, mm -hmm. if, if I offered you a metal beaker for uh, a dollar um, and someone offered another metal be beaker mm -hmm. for 90 cents, you would take the 90 cents one because they're perceived to be the same. But the minute you start differentiating, the more you differentiate, the less and less sensitive those price differentials essentially become um, and, and the more immune consumers are to them to the point where you'll pay anything for an iPhone because you don't perceive it to be the same as a Samsung yeah. or whatever. Yes. And, and Kantar has that data showing that, um, you know, the more meaningful different your brand is perceived to be, the more that plays a, a massive role in pricing power. I forget the actual proportion, but it's big, right? It's about half of your pricing power is differentiation. The yeah. challenge I think that you and I and, and many people have faced is when people critique differentiation, they critique the old 1950s unique selling points, you know, you know, there's no such thing as unique differentiation. Well, that's absolutely true, there isn't. But relative differentiation, you know, being seen as being more of something than the competition, I think yeah. is an incredible lever of profitability. And and that's something Kantar, I think, almost uniquely now has continued to show and remind marketers. And I think it's a hugely important point that you want to try and position yourself as relatively different, partly because it does help a little bit in, in attracting customers, but more importantly, it helps to be able to then sell them a product at a much higher price than would otherwise be possible. Yes, exactly that, Mark. Thank you. It's been wonderful to chat, clear and inspiring as ever. Thank you very much. Bye. Hey, and thank, thanks for the report, Mary. It really I'm not just saying it. It's really good. <laughs> well done. Congratulations. I take it, um, especially because it's coming from you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Mary. Bye.